The word of the Lord as it comes from the epistle to the Hebrews, we will be reading from chapter 13, verses 1 through 16. Let us once again listen to and for the word of the Lord. As the writer tells his community, let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison, as though you were in prison with them, those who are being tortured as though you yourselves were being tortured. Let marriage be held in honor by all, and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled. For God will judge all fornicators and adulterers. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. And I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. For you see, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. For it is well for the heart to be strengthened by grace and not by regulations about food which have not benefited those who observe them. We have an altar from which those who officiate in the tent have no right to eat, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by a high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the city in order to sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bear the abuse that he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through him then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? We thank you, O oh God, for your presence in this place. But we'd ask now that all the more your precious Holy Spirit might fill this place in your people, that your word might go forth and not come back void, but accomplish that which you purpose. So speak now, if you would, because your people are listening. And speak now, if you would, because your servant is listening. In the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray, and the people of God all said, Amen. Amen. In the, the gospel, according to Gamble and Huff, y'all don't know them, but we'll get there. In the year of our Lord, 1978, they composed a book subtitled Ship Ahoy. And then they had several different chapters that I think speak to our journey of faith as we come to the end of this sermon series. In chapter one, the writer asks this plaintive question. Now that we found love, what we're going to do with it? What does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked, for the writer of Hebrews is asking us that same question. Now that we found love, what will we do with it? You remember that in the beginning of the book, the writer says, in the former days, long ago, God spoke through various and sundry means, including 
prophets and priests and kings. But in the latter days, he has spoken to us by a son. And he goes on to tell the story about how that son, God in Christ, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Emmanuel, God with us, who was with us, who lived amongst us, laughed amongst us, loved amongst us, taught us, fed us, healed us, was killed, crucified, buried, but on the third day, God raised him from the dead, and now he lives forever. And right about here, somebody ought to say amen. amen. And, 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 and as the writer tells that story, he says, because that is so, because God has acted so decisively in the person of Jesus Christ, he goes on to tell how that story, that life, that gospel has gone forth into the world and what it has accomplished. And as we began this journey of faith, you will remember chapter 11. You remember chapter 11. You remember by faith. And told the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Noah and all of those who by faith did a both and. Was it both and? Both, you remember, speaking of faith, is belief, obedience, trust, and hope. Can I repeat that? Belief, obedience, trust, and hope. And even though they did not see the final act of the play, they still acted in faith, and their faith is a record to inspire us even today. And so it is that after he has told these great stories, at the end of chapter 12, knowing that we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we might lay aside every sin and weight that clings so closely and run the race of faith. But at the end of chapter 12, and you remember this, say yes, even if you don't. He says, since we have been given a marvelous kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us then hold fast, because our God will come and judge, and our God is a consuming fire. In other words, if you don't want to go that way, you want to go this way. And so he says, now, now that you know the love of God so well, what are you going to do with it? And then he says, well, let me answer that question for you. He says, the first thing is, let mutual love continue. And then he goes on to say, you should receive with great hospitality both your friends and strangers. Now, Gamble and Huff, in chapter 2, said this, don't call me brother. What are the lyrics to that? Glad you asked me, because you got to get the album. By the way, the album in 1978 shot to the top of the R&B charts because it had this strange mixture of nice R&B tunes, love songs, and some really infectious grooves. <laughs> and I'm going to get to the groove part in a minute. Hold on, honey. He said, don't call me brother. And the lyrics say, how can you call me brother when you are not even searching for the truth? How can you call me brother when I cannot even depend on you? How can you call me brother when you cheat and steal and lie? How can you call me brother when you can't even look me in the eye? And I would say to you that even today, there's a lot of folks who refuse to accept strangers because we're scared, that we distrust. What was the context of the writer? I'm glad you asked me. The context of the writer in late first century Christian community was this. The Christian community was under fire. It was persecuted. People could have their property confiscated. They could be put in jail. Hold that note on jail. We'll be back to it. And also during that time, uh, there were several itinerant Christian preachers and others who depended upon the hospitality of local faith communities. Stop me if you hear something familiar. And, and the two words that undergird this text that you might want to be aware of are Philadelphia and Philozenia. Love of brother, love of stranger. 
in this day and age, I would suggest that even within Christian communities, sometimes we're so insulated and isolated, we don't trust one another. But he goes on to say that if you open your door, your heart, yourself to provide hospitality. Hey, how y'all doing? This is really rude, isn't it? That's, I don't want y'all to get the wrong idea about this. Just, okay, so, so it says, it says that even as you open yourself to hospitality to strangers, even then some people have entertained angels unaware. What story might that be? Oh, I don't know. Maybe Genesis uh, 18. Y'all want, really want me to work today, don't you? When Abraham entertained the three visitors, he had been looking to have some chilling, and, and, the, and, 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 and the visitors, after they had eaten, because they were Methodists, said, you're going to have a child? And Abraham was 157, and Sarah was 99 and a half, and she's in the back saying, ha <laughs> ha! And they're saying it's true. In other words, when we open ourselves up in the sense of hospitality, sometimes when we're trying to bless others, that's when we get blessed in return. It is our task to be hospitable people and to extend the hospitality of the church, not just here among ourselves, but with everybody. Somebody say everybody. Everybody. And so it is that Gamble and Huff have wrote, written in chapter 2, don't call me brother, but I want to call each of you my brother and my sister, and so it should be. And then he goes on to say <clears throat> that you ought to uh, have care and concern for those who are in prison. Uh, chapter 3 would be the song called Ship Ahoy. Ship Ahoy was a poignant piece, a socially relevant piece that harkened back to the slave trade and the mid-Atlantic journey, and the torture and the pain of the people felt because they were going to an uncertain future, but that future held little for them. It was constrained. They would be imprisoned in chains, in servitude for the rest of their natural lives. So what was the context of the writer? Well, there are two things we want to remember. <clears throat> First of all, once again, the Christian community in that day and age was under fire. They could be imprisoned, and a good number of their members had already been in prison. So he was saying, remember your peoples who are in prison as though you were in prison. But let me take a step back and bring this to 2016. We have a care and concern for all people who are incarcerated. We have a thriving prison ministry called Kairos. If you're not involved in it one way, get involved in another. Because once again, if I go back to offering hospitality to strangers, I went there thinking, I'm taking Jesus to people who need him. I left there knowing that Jesus had been there to receive me when I went. We have created such a tremendous Christian community behind prison walls that I feel better about young men, and let me be honest, young African-American men in particular who go in there because they have a community that can surround them. Because so many of these folks are in the wrong place, wrong time, and some of them, and you will know this, because they are young, they are terminally stupid. <laughs> can I get a witness somewhere? And, 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 and my personal witness is that there but by the grace of God, well, I, And if anything is ever going to change, because you know the other parts of the prison system are horrific, and so rehabilitation is really a challenge, but if we can get enough Jesus in there, I feel good about what can happen. As the statistics say, the people who enter the Kairos program are far less likely to be recidivistic. Hallelujah. But I would also say this. We still have to do enough work to help them transition when they get out. We've had two brothers come to visit us, and we're glad they're out, but they're having a rough time. We need to provide a safe space for them to get their feet up under them, get themselves together, 
get a job, get productive. But the other thing is this, that even Christian folks who are not behind prison bars, many people are in prisons of their own making. A whole lot of people are in bondage to all kinds of stuff. And it is our task to help them in Christian love to get loosed of whatever got them. And, 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 and you can fill in the blank because the next chapter of the book, according to Gamble and Huff, is really one where I think most of us need to do the most work. So we should care for those in prison as though we were in prison. And then the next chapter of Gamble and Huff is the infectious groove part. It's called For the Love of Money. You've heard it on every commercial on your TV. It has this bass run that is a killer. Dum, 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 dum. For the love of money, he says, for the love of money, people will lie, rob, chill, kill, or, or, or cheat. For the love of money, people don't know who they'll hurt or beat. For the love of money, a woman will sell her precious body. For a small piece of paper, it carries a lot of weight. For that mean, mean green, for the love of money. He says, keep yourselves free from the love of money, does the writer of Hebrews. And can I get, just get one witness? Just raise your hand before I even jump in here. We are caught in a culture of overt, conspicuous consumption and materialism. We, we are always looking for the next, the new, the bigger, the brighter, the, the, the more. We, we just built that. And you know, once again, let me help you. Can I help you? Look to your left, look to your right, and say, it's not my fault. Not, not my fault. Why? What do you mean? Because Madison Avenue has your number. They know exactly how to get to you. They know exactly how many times to get to you. They know exactly what vehicle to get to you. I know because my lovely wife, hey dear, used to be in marketing for McDonald's. And, and, and you think Ronald McDonald is cute, but he is a device. Are you with me here? Because burgers are fun. Mama, I want, how many of you, Mama, I want to go to McDonald's. McDonald's, you got perfectly good ground beef in your refrigerator. <laughs> Am I right? But, but uh, Mom, I want to go to McDonald's. I want a Happy Meal. I want a toy. I want a, and, and, and how many of you know, I'm just picking on children right now, but I'm talking about all the big kids like one big kid that has this insatiable appetite for, come on, fill in the blank. All right? I've pretty much given up on the dream. But I would look so smooth if I had that BMW 5 standard shift, black on black, black leather interior. But Anna and Dad would have to look out. That's to clear all the people from the street. That boy going 98 miles an hour down Little River, Little River Turnpike. Yeah! But it's more than that. It's how you look. It's what you wear. It's what you eat. You got to have brand name this and brand name that. You got to have pure wool this and pure silk that. Come on. I, I, I'm just preaching to me right now, so that's all right. You know, when I could be perfectly content with two sisters, Polly and Esther. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> give it up, give it up, yeah, yeah, now, for the love of money. And, 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 and how many of you know, uh, and you felt this, you got a raise, okay? And your raise was this, and you said, Good God Almighty, look at that money I'm making. And you got the check. And somehow or another, it still was not enough. You know, there's this fallacy, this, this, this crazy thing that if I just had one more dollar, everything would be all right. And you got one more dollar, 
and it ain't. And so the writer of Hebrews says, learn how to be content. Contented with what you got. If you got, did you hear my prayer? I pray that every morning. Thank you, oh God, for life and health and strength. Thank you, oh God, for food and shelter and clothing. That's it. If you got that, you're good. But what we have become is a nation and a culture of hoarding. You know, I, we're afraid we won't have enough. And, and, and you really want to find the people who really think that's true? Find somebody who lived through the Depression. Go in their house and see if they don't have 15 cows in the freezer. Amen. And, and 47 pounds of tomatoes and other things in mason jar. And, 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 and $100,000 in their mattress. Hey, it happened once. Could happen again. We need to free ourselves. And our lives would be so much better if we could. And then finally, amen. I think they threw out the first pitch already. Finally, he, he says, how can you be secure in all of this? He says, because God has said to us, he will never leave us nor forsake us, but be with us even until the end. And so Christ went outside the gates, and let us follow Christ outside the gates, because we live not in a permanent city, not a lasting city, but we look forward to a city not made with hands that will last forever. So the final chapter of Gamble and Huffs is called Put Your Hands Together. He said, and let us pray. Let us pray for all the people living in the streets. Let us pray for all the people who don't have enough to eat. Let us pray that tomorrow will be a better day. Yes, he said, we got to pull our forces together and sing a song so loud, so clear. We're going to shout glory, hallelujah, so that the whole wide world can hear now that you found love. What are you? Amen.